the two greatest inventions of all times are probably fire and the wheel. I'm sure it was only a matter of time before somebody came along and tried to put the two together. One such attempt to make wheels go with fire was made in 1816 by the Reverend Robert Stirling in Scotland. And the so-called Stirling's engine has been in disuse ever since. To understand why, we need to know how it works. Imagine you've got some air trapped in a cylinder by a tight-fitting but easily sliding piston. What could you do to make that piston move? Well, you could light a fire under the cylinder, heating up the air, and causing the pressure to push the piston out. But now what do you do if you want the piston to go back in? Well, you could cool down the cylinder, causing the air inside to contract, and then atmospheric pressure would push the piston back in. That's all well and good, but what if you want to do that over and over and over again, really, really fast? You take the entire engine and move it to a hot place, and then move it back to a cold place, and then move it back to the hot place? Or do you light a fire under it, and blow it out really fast, light it again, blow it out, over and over? Not if you're a clever Scotsman like Robert Stirling, you know. He realized, probably after trying those first two methods, that you could have part of the engine hot and part of the engine cool at the same time and then just move the air inside the engine back and forth between the two. This is what that would look like. The air moves to the hot section, expands, pushes out the piston, then moves back to the cold section, cools and contracts, drawing the piston back in, and then it starts all over again. Ah, you say, but what makes the air move back and forth? This thing, the displacer. It's just an object inside the engine taking up space. Wherever the displacer is not, that's where most of the air is. The displacer and the piston are linked by a crankshaft, with the displacer always a quarter of a turn of the crank ahead of the piston. This is a model Stirling engine that anyone can get. There's a burner underneath the hot side of the engine, and then there's the cool side, and the displacer moves back and forth inside. This is the power cylinder with the piston in it connected to the crankshaft. After putting a bit of alcohol in the burner, light the wick and wait for it to warm up a little bit. Now with a finger you just spin the flywheel in the right direction and when the engine's warm enough it'll take off. There it goes. It really runs, doesn't it? Well, I wonder how much power is actually being produced by this. But we're about to find out using science. Using a 10 milligram balance and a stopwatch, I first determined that the burner is consuming about 2 milligrams of alcohol per second. That's the equivalent of 60 watts of heat. We need a way to measure the speed, and this is it. It's the veneer photogate. It's a timing gate. We'll fix it to the engine using ordinary blue tack. Just plug it into the veneer lab quest like so, and it's ready to use. Easy. But what are we going to time? Well, we're going to time revolutions of the flywheel, and we'll do that by sticking a piece of card, again with blue tack, to the inside of one of the flywheels. Let's see if the detector picks it up. Yes, it does. Works perfectly. The tricky part is that the photogate is usually used for measuring linear velocities and distances. It wants to know what is the distance traveled between pulses. Well, we're going to measure rotational motion, and so the distance is going to be 2 pi radians, or 6.27 radians, between each pulse. Velocities will show up in meters per second, but we'll know it really means radians per second. We start the recording, give the wheel a spin, and off we go. After a few more minutes, we'll blow out the flame, let it spin down, stop the recording, and see what the results are. Let's bring up just the velocity graph, and yes, it shows that after 29 seconds, it reached a peak velocity of 186 radians per second. But what's that in plain English? Well, that happens to be 1776 revolutions per minute. Not too shabby. Now we need a way to place the engine under a very precisely controlled load. 
and to measure that load. I went in kind of mechanical linkage, gears, belts, pulleys, that sort of thing. We're going to be far too crude for a small model engine like this, not to mention being expensive and time consuming. However, there is a surprisingly simple and very accurate way to do this with almost no moving parts. Because the wheel is bronze, that is conductive but not magnetic, we can place a magnet next to the wheel. The magnet exerts a force on the wheel and the wheel on the magnet, and we can measure that force. It works whether the wheel spins one way or the other. So we'll attach a big magnet to the veneer force gauge. Set the force gauge up on a stand and move it towards the wheel. By positioning the magnet near or far to the spinning flywheel, we can increase or decrease the amount of load on the engine. The force gauge connects to the LabQuest just like that and is instantly recognized as force. We'll zero out the force and we'll be ready to go. The momentum of the flywheel gradually builds as the engine reaches its free running speed. We'll let it get up to that speed and keep it there for a little while while we collect data. We can see the speed increasing gradually on the Logger Pro screen. There it is down at the bottom. Also we can read the force. The force gauge is near the limit of its resolution, meaning we'll need to take a lot of data in order to get statistically good results. Once the engine has reached its free running speed, we'll leave it for a few seconds, collect the data before applying a load to the engine. Now that it's at its free running speed and it's been there for a while, we'll position the engine closer to the magnet. The magnet will exert a load on the engine that will be recorded by the force gauge. We can see there is immediate change in the force and an immediate drop in the speed of the engine. We'll allow that to go on for a few seconds so we can get a good reading on that change of force. We'll look at the difference in force before and after applying the load to the engine. Now that it's been running like that for some time, I've moved it away from the magnet and the speed is again increasing, returning to its free running speed. We'll select some of the data and get the statistics on the average of the force. And we see that there's a distinct difference between before and after moving the magnet into position. That difference will be the force on the engine or the load on the engine. We can also get the average speed of the engine during that time. Now we're ready for some calculations. The power output of a rotating machine is its torque times its angular velocity. So we multiply the force times the radius of the wheel times the speed in radians per second. What we find is that the Stirling engine is putting out 12 milliwatts of power. Now a model engine from an airplane puts out around 200 watts of power and is about half the size of this engine. In other words, that engine replaces 16,000 Stirling engines of equivalent size. In 1814, when the Reverend Robert Stirling first came up with his idea, the science of thermodynamics was just getting underway. It wasn't until 1824 that Carnot first published his ideas, and the ability to understand engines developed over the following 80 years. Carnot's theoretical work influenced, for example, one inventor named Rudolf Diesel. I think you've heard of his engine. The Stirling engine, though, has yet to find an economic role to play. It may someday, but so far that hasn't happened. Some proposals exist for renewable energy applications, but these have yet to prove commercially viable. Because if an engine can't do a job at a given price, its efficiency just doesn't enter into it. Although it's never really been all that useful, the Stirling engine is still one of the most fascinating inventions of all times.